we're going to get even further right to the heart of controversial topics. This was a great framing, but as all of you know, artificial intelligence is the hot big new idea, which will be such probably for many years to come. It's also very controversial in this space of national security. Just a couple of examples. I think you're all familiar with Project Maven, where Google was going to try not necessarily to be involved in a kill chain for the Department of Defense, but to help find certain kinds of threatening targets. That became, by far and away, to my knowledge, the most controversial contract within Google, probably in its history, even though it was only $9 million, which for Google is sort of like, you know, pocket change at best. And, and ultimately, Google decided not to pursue this concept. That's a short-term issue of intelligence gathering and processing, very much along the lines of the kind of conversation we just heard with Director Cardillo. But as you also know, there is a bigger debate looming about to what extent artificial intelligence will affect everything. And to what extent the concept of a Terminator uh, may not just be science fiction in five or 10 or 15 years. To what extent adversaries could weaponize artificial intelligence. Some of this will almost inevitably happen. Some of it probably must happen because the arms control of preventing it will be so difficult. Other aspects, the, the literal Terminator robot, probably is something a lot of us have qualms about and will want to debate for many years. So this is happening fast. I was just in a panel discussion yesterday with a colleague of mine, Chris Messerol, who talked about how much faster the algorithms for AI have progressed relative to what was expected. Even if people took so-called Moore's Law expected rates of computer progress and continue to extrapolate Moore's law into the future as if it was inevitable that we'd keep doubling processing speed every couple of years. Even though people were sort of already counting on that, they hadn't imagined how quickly artificial intelligence could progress. And the last thing I'll say before uh, turning the floor over uh, to Eric Adams and his distinguished panel that he'll introduce is that I sometimes think, I would, here you'll get a uh, maybe relate to this, although you're a much younger man than I, but I sometimes think those of us who are a little uh, older, we don't necessarily have any more processing speed up here, but we've had more time to make mistakes and, and develop algorithms for hopefully not to repeat the same mistakes. In a sense, that's what AI does. It doesn't have to be super smart. These are not incredibly ingenious algorithms that have all sorts of paths and, you know, millions and tens of millions of lines of code necessarily. They are sometimes rather simple mechanisms for going through data and learning when you make a mistake and then remembering not to repeat it. And you combine that with high-speed computing, you can do incredible things. Anyway, the people who are about to talk to you about this know much more than I do. So without further ado, let me introduce them. And uh, best wishes to you all. Oops. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel. This is the new age of artificial intelligence. Uh, I am your moderator. My name is Eric Adams. I am a journalist and a contributor to Wired Magazine and Popular Science and a variety of other outlets. And I'd like to uh, quickly introduce our panelists here. We have John Doyon, uh, who is the uh, director of the Office of Data Strategy and Innovation at the National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, right to my left, Dr. Valerie Browning, the director of DARPA's Defense Sciences Office. Uh, and DARPA, if you don't know, is a Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Very good. Awesome. <laughs> and they do a lot of really intense R&D work for the Department of Defense. Uh, to my right, we have uh, Dr. Meg Leda Jones, Assistant Professor of Communication, Culture, and Technology uh, here at Georgetown. And next to her is, uh, Pat, is oops, sorry, Andy. Andy Brooks, Chief Data Scientist at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, our host today. And then Patty, Patty Mims, Director of Global National Government at ESRI. And ESRI is a, an agency that contributes uh, mapping data and analytics to agencies such as what these folks represent up here. So let's talk for a little, just really briefly before we dive into the panel, what we're even talking about here. What is 
artificial intelligence. Quite simply, it's the computer system's ability to process information, analyze it, and take action of some sort based on its goals or its operator's needs. Uh, it's a decades-long process basically of giving computers the ability to think and process, if not actually possess the judgment of a human uh, individual. Um, in my role as a technology journalist for Wired, I've seen it everywhere already. It's in the automotive industry. I drove a car yesterday from, or last week from Mercedes that uses artificial intelligence to comprehend natural language. So you can speak to it as though you're talking to a friend and it will do what you want it to do. I drove in Google's Waymo car a couple weeks ago that uses artificial intelligence to train the entire fleet of autonomous cars how to drive on public roads. Not just the stop signs and the merging and all that, but how to deal with the, mer the uh, peripheral marginal events like not being able to see a, a stoplight behind the sun or what do you do if a, a clown jumps in front of you on the road? Do you mow it down or do you stop? I don't know. <laughs> we have to figure that out. Um, businesses use it. The, you know, Amazon uses AI intensely to figure out how to move its packages around efficiently. And you know, of course, we all see it in Alexa and Siri. And so it's turning up in a lot of places. Uh, it's in aviation. Future air taxis are going to depend on AI to be able to fly without human pilots. The military is deep into it. And so, of course, is the national security field, which is our subject here today. It's being developed for cybersecurity, for information security, for defense, financial investigations, um, sorting through vast amounts of data from any of these fields, and it's a force multiplier, and it's also an enabler of further innovation. So the question for today's panels is going to be the challenges. How, do you, um, how does science support security? Uh, what are the points of resistance going to be along this path? Um, and for instance, to cite another AI realm, uh, Google's autonomous cars can get away with lots of machine learning because they're on the ground and you can program in a lot of behaviors, but those developing aircraft with autonomous systems don't want that kind of training. They want it to be more programmed rather than machine learning. So what's the distinction in security? What systems do you allow them to train themselves versus tell them what to do at the outset? And there are risks ahead for the industry. This is a new thing. It's an exciting thing, which is makes it fun and engaging and very promising. And, but there are going to be bumps along the way. There are some systems in development that have already presented their own kinds of challenges. One system uses pattern recognition. And it took a look at, uh, and this is an R&D project, took a look at an individual with his hands in the air and said, that's a rabbit. Okay? And it wasn't a rabbit. It was a person with his hands in the air surrendering. And so that was a system that didn't work the way they expected it to. And also, when AI is training itself, there are cases where it can learn the wrong thing. Getting back to the car example, uh, an AI vehicle, uh, in a recent case, you was learning how to go through an intersection. And it discovered that if you are a little bit more assertive, people will yield to you. If, you're, if they are just sort of blithely walking across in an intersection, they will yield. So it's, capitalized on that, and the next time it was a little bit more assertive. And you can see where that's going. It taught itself the wrong thing, and it became a lot more aggressive in that intersection than it should. So the point of those examples is to say that this needs to, there needs to be oversight for this, for artificial intelligence, whether it's in the consumer realm or in national security. And now, of course, national security has its own challenges, unique challenges to being security. Uh, it can't exist in a black box, but it also can't be fully transparent. So what are the challenges there? So without further ado, let's dive into the panel. Um, and the first question that I wanted to uh, address, I'm going to throw this first to, um, to Andy down there, is where are we with this right now? What roles possess the most um, promise for artificial intelligence and national security? And what is its potential and its possible limits? So where do you think we are with this right now? Thanks, Eric. Um, so it's one of just looking at um, for where we are with it. There's so many opportunities for us to use um, AI and all the many different variations of what that is uh, inside national security. Uh, one that I'm most interested in or you're fascinated by, like at NGA, like in my role, is one where we do geospatial intelligence. So anything with a longitude, latitude, and a timestamp, right? Uh, what I'm fascinated by is looking go back in the history of our agency, 
right, is we do geospatial oftentimes overhead like, you know, imagery looking down on the earth, right? Um, back in the day, we would get maybe um, a handful of pictures of a place, right? Um, and then we would maybe get it every day or every couple days, things like that. Um, the challenge that we have now is just like the sheer volume of imagery that can come in for us. You know, so at any moment you could get um, from our, our ex existing sources, from satellites, from partner agencies, or um, partner agencies that have that private industry, things like that. Um, the biggest challenge that we have is what do we, how do we not just technically ingest all of that, but how do we analyze all of that? Because in the past you would have an imagery analyst who would then look at a picture. You know, a picture would come in, a hard copy, you know, big kind of thing, and they look at it and be like, is there anything there, right? Challenges right now and real opportunity is we have this volume of imagery and, and other data coming in. How can we automate that in some way? Right? to smooth and expedite that process. So those analysts can then look at that imagery data um, for the really key challenging hard bits, not the easy ones or the basic ones. You know? How can we do that? That I see is the most like, tremendous like, opportunity lift for us right now. I mean, there's many others, but that's one where I really am fascinated by, is looking at all the imagery or potential sources of data that we can get now, and how can we use technology to really help focus down for that really key valuable bit, right? to help us sift through that. Right, to get smarter from this big volume of things coming down to a smaller set that then our analysts can then look at for the really super hard problems, the ones they're really, really good at. You know, teasing out what is that thing in that picture? What is the meaning behind that, right? I don't want them to waste their time looking at all these things that don't have meaning. So that's a focus one, is how can automation in particular help with analyzing the data that we have coming in so that we can better focus our time and energy and our smarts on those really key bits so we can pass that information on to decision makers. So taking the busy work out and letting them focus on the analysis. Yes, That's yeah, as we, so. we train them to be analysts, they are amazing at being analysts, and it's like, let's get them the tools to be able to do that the best, the best they can. Okay, fantastic, and John, we also spoke about this. Do you have, what, what is your perspective on the potential here for this technology? Um, well, I'll speak to the counterterrorism mission aspect of it, but first I just want to take a second to say the, um, the program didn't have background on my education, and if it had, you would have seen I have a Master of Arts degree from Georgetown University's National Security Studies program. So it's nice to be back, um, and I hope you're enjoying the program as much as I did. Um, that said, from the, the CT mission area, um, data is everything, similar to, to you, Andy, and we're pretty much drowning in data. Data volume and velocity are overwhelming human-based uh, analytic workflows. We cannot keep up. Uh, and so uh, the technologies of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, offer a lot of promise to that challenge. It, uh, at NCTC, we ingest every day, and probably similar things to, to any mission set, but we ingest hundreds of data sets, and we, we, you know, they vary in size from megabytes to petabytes, and they're unstructured data, and they can be dirty data, um, and uh, you know, on top of that, analysts are challenged with just access to dozens of other databases across government. Um, thousands of databases across government. Our operations center gets 10,000 cables in from around the world every day. Um, and you know, the bottom line then is that to do the counterterrorism mission, um, we can't buy enough analysts to be effective uh, and, and to do our job. So machine uh, learning and artificial intelligence really are mission imperatives for us. So we are looking to these technologies to help us with things like unstructured data or cleaning up dirty data that uh, dirty being maybe there's uh, some information captured on the battlefield and from a cell phone and there could be viruses or other uh, things in there that you might not want to ingest into your uh, uh, network. Um, and we're looking to see how we can use algorithms and things basically to help our analysts be more productive. Analysts have to be in the loop. Uh, this isn't going to be some magical way that the machines make these decisions, but we're looking to see how, how they can be more productive. And we're seeing some success, which is good um, and encouraging to us, and um, uh, we continue to work on ways we can implement these technologies to, to do our mission. Fantastic. And Valerie at DARPA, what are you seeing there? You, have, you, have, you, you guys tend to work anywhere from 10 to 100 years in the future. <laughs> and obviously, this is a big part of everything that you're doing. What, what, what are you seeing uh, is this potential here? So 
<clears throat> in terms of potential uh, applications relevant to national security, I think that those opportunities are the ones that are most analogous to where uh, AI, uh, state of the art AI is being um, applied in the commercial world today. And so applications that involve um, uh, natural language processing, voice recognition, pa pattern matching type applications. And they work well in cases where there's lots of high quality, um, uh, as complete as possible, um, labeled data sets. And so those are the applications within the national security and from my, from my perspective, the DOD, where there's the greatest opportunity. So um, as a tool for analysts in searching through large uh, image databases, uh, in the, in the um, healthcare industry when you're trying to uh, look at, you know, sort of a holistic view of, a, of patients trying to, to um, look at different, um, different uh, types of data, health data, and prosthetics as we're beginning to move. DARPA's been investing in next generation prosthetics that can actually be con you know, mind controlled and understanding um, the relationship between the, the neural pathways and the, and the prosthetics. So those applications where we, we understand the rules, have good, have, have good um, high quality labeled data sets are the ones where we um, have the most opportunity in the near term to be able to apply state-of-the-art AI as it stands today. Okay. And where is the technology coming from? You, DARPA, more than a lot of agencies, tends to work with Silicon Valley and with the technology firms that are leading this field. Uh, is this being developed internally or are you partnering with industry? Uh, both, but to be clear, DARPA is a funding agency, so we ourselves don't do, we, we, we contract out. A lot of the fundamental science that uh, we are uh, investing in to better understand AI, its limitations, where it can be applied, uh, is going to the uh, academic community. Um, but we also leverage where we can. We have regular conversations with uh, the Googles and the Facebooks and understand, and, and we leverage where we can uh, the innovation that they're doing as well. Okay, very good. Um, now, one of the, the possible uh, bumps along the road is going to be how AI interacts with the humans <laughs> who are at the controls, whether it's the pilots in the air or whether it's the analysts in the field. And so my next question is um, whether AI-generated judgments are being accepted by the human workforce. How is the early integration of this playing out? Um, what are some of the conflicts that we might see going forward? What are the ethical implications? Uh, and what, what is the path for getting this technology to work harmoniously with humans and getting humans to accept it? So I'd like to go first to Meg with this. You've, been, you've done a lot of research in the human uh, interface the, or the human uh, implications and impact of this technology and how humans work with it. What are you seeing the way as this is gonna go forward? Yeah, I am fascinated by the human in the loop and how we see ourselves um, operating within these systems. There's a couple of generic concerns when you automate anything. Um, there's skill degradation that we worry about. There's um, a lack of situ situational awareness. And there's a concern of automation bias. And automation bias is this over-reliance on um, usually computer systems, but any automated system it would apply to. Um, it is, actually means the wrong type of reliance. So people often under rely on uh, automated systems, usually because the air settings are wrong. So imagine you live in a house when your smoke detector keeps going off. Um, the next time it goes off, you're not running out the door because you are convinced that there's a fire in the house. You just hit it with a broomstick until it falls down. Um, that would be an automation bias problem. Um, Over-reliance, uh, we have a couple of high risk examples of that and oftentimes we do see automation over reliance in high risk situations where you can imagine that people don't want to be the um, entity that the responsibility rests on their shoulders. So um, there are a couple of examples of um, pilots ignoring what they're actually seeing and relying on a computer system to tell them something is either an enemy combatant um, or a commercial plane when it was the other. Um, and also we see this sometimes in medical diagnoses. And so there are automation design accounts for these things and they try to set up the system um, with the human in the loop uh, in a way that 
is really delicate to how delicate we are in these, in these systems. So they're modeled in a way that the error settings are, are placed just right so that we really pay attention to them. And what we're learning, I think, most recently is that accountability structures also need to be in place so that the individual is aware that they are going to be accountable for this. And so that helps them remain situationally aware uh, of their circumstances because they might be called on to rely on that or their degraded skills, so they may um, keep up those skills. Um, another way that we see this is de-blackboxing the system so that people understand the error rates. Um, and if you watch tennis, um, this I think is the easiest way to, that we do this every day. When you watch tennis and the Hawkeye system projects whether the ball was in and out, and it's become this really fun, entertaining aspect of, of tennis. The whole crowd, even the players and the ref, turned to the screen to see, did the ball go in or out? Like We, we all watched it, but did it uh, go in or out? And it's, it's not even a replay of the actual event. It's just a, um, a virtual markup of the prediction of where the ball would have landed. And there's an error rate of anywhere between three and five millimeters. But we all watch it, and there's no doubt. It just says in or out, and the rules of tennis say you can't challenge it. The Hawkeye has the end. Um, and result, but if you watch cricket, when they use the Hawkeye system, it pops up with an error rate. So it says a certain amount, uh, it gives you a certainty um, whether you should really rely on that. And if the certainty is below a level, it kicks it to the umpires. I don't know cricket, I don't know. Are they called umpires, refs? Um, uh, I only know about Hawkeye and, and cricket. Uh, umps, uh, and, they, and their, their decision holds. Um, so we do this every day um, as we go through and, and um, think about how these we rely on these systems too. And, and we catch ourselves, I think, over-relying on them often when we understand the risks as low. Um, and so I think that we have a lot to learn uh, as these are taken out of high-risk scenarios like nuclear power plants and kind of put into the everyday world. Uh, we still have a lot of research, I think, to do there. Sure. I'm going to throw the same question to Patty in a second, but I wanted to follow up with you about this notion of public acceptance of what's going on here, because we, we can't have this moment 15 or 20 years from now where there's a congressional hearing and everyone suddenly realizes that AI has been used in defense and national security for the last 15 years. Do you think, like, how, how do we get the public behind this or make them aware of it without showing the hand of the security, you know, conscious groups? I have no idea. I don't know a lot about security, but I do think that it is a hard time to convince the public to trust anything. Yeah. And so I do think you really want to be careful with how aggressive you're being with certain AI systems and to, and to be very conscious of the fact that there's this animosity and this distrust. Um, I, th I think that that we have seen throughout history that that is really important to technological development and how it moves throughout society. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Patty, the same question. You, you're, you're on the front lines. You have the, the information, you have the imagery, you have the analysts. How is AI being deployed with your group and what are the challenges and the, the opportunities and what, what are you seeing in terms of how the, your personnel are interacting with it? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Eric, and thank you for um, having me here today. Um, so we are a technology company and work with lots of customers, including NGA and others across the intelligence community, as well as across the commercial sector. So we definitely see AI in use right now uh, with our customers. For example, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation is using it to identify places of pollution, um, um, the places that we're going out and and dumping our trash and are polluting the bay and how to make sure they can uh, look for where those places are gonna be in the future um, and how do they prevent those things, whether it's through um, um, marketing to the uh, public about where, um, how to clean up and places to go or where they can invest their tools. Or I'm sure everybody here likes to have power. We work with, uh, nobody likes to have their TV cut off on, uh, on Football Sunday, so we also work with major um, a uh, utility company that in the past lines would break. There's um, uh, loads and loads of network lines uh, supporting the utilities 
obviously. Now there's AI being used to, uh, to look at where that erosion is happening so they can be preventative and um, keeping your uh, utilities up and running all the time. So it's something that's probably affecting you right now and you don't even know it um, to, because you're not losing power, right? So, um, which is a good thing. I, I will say where we do see things um, that we haven't really talked about yet is there's always going to be uh, the human in the loop on these things because, for example, in the intelligence space, our adversaries are smart also. So we may be working and find uh, a solution and things that we're looking for, but our adversaries know that we're smart and looking for these things. So if we can identify things, for example, on imagery, um, there are ways then to, to um, to mask those things so they look different next time. So those are definitely challenges that we have and that cause that, that lack of trust in the system. So one of the things we also see is community. So people coming together as a community, whether it's um, coming together in person um, for meetings and community group meetings to share best practices, whether it's creating blogs online, whether it's sharing information through reports, um, we see people coming together across different communities to share the lessons learned and the things that they um, um, see working and that they see not working and how they can improve as they move forward. Excellent. And you, you and I also spoke about you know, a particular interest to the students present. Um, what skills are going to be required by analysts to leverage AI and machine learning going forward? This is a new thing, how is, how, what, what are they going to have to adapt to or prepare for uh, moving through their careers? Yeah, that's a, a, a good question. I'll make a shameless plug. We're gonna be at the career fair later today, so we are hiring. Um, and we, you know, we're hiring, um, I, I would break it into kind of two categories. So one is there's always gonna be the people who are creating the AI tools. Um, and I actually went and look back at the last couple software developers that we hired for AI and their computer science, their engineers, um, they have those hard technical skills. However, we're also hiring analysts, people who can help, um, who use the tools, right? We're developing technology, but we want people who can use those tools. And we're really looking for people who can think analytically, who have statistical um, um, skills, right? Statistical backgrounds. Um, who um, can think about problems in a different way, um, who have maybe a little bit of coding skills. I would recommend you know, looking into maybe you don't want to be a developer but have a little bit of Python skills. I know Director Cardillo even did a little uh, programming uh, in his, a little, right, in his uh, career um, in the last uh, year or two. So those are the things, everybody can have a little bit of those skills and those things combined, I think, make a, a good analyst. Andy? Can I extend that one? Um, in my role like an NGA, is, um, I've hired a lot of people this year um, for one of my teams. Is we had a team of 85 that we filled, all with data tech backgrounds, data scientists, data analysts, data engineers, things like that. Um, learned a lot of things. One of the key things I was always most interested in is, are people interested, do they know how to ask really good questions? Right? And like impactful questions, right? Um, that's kind of a big, broad, you know, doesn't matter what your major is, things like that. Can you ask good inquiry questions? Do you know how to do that? Um, another one is that like attitude and aptitude to learn whatever is like a lifelong learning kind of thing, whatever's coming next. People go, oh, what programming language should I learn right now? And I go, well, like R and Python's hot, but like I remember when C was hot. What you need to know is just like, what is programming and how do you use that, right? And learning and having literacy about that. And that literacy could be anywhere from knowing understand how to do basic scripting to all the way writing your own algorithms, right? There's a continuum there, right? You need to hit that, whatever is your sweet spot in that. Um, also with skills too is I, I really liked people who came in with an awareness and inquiry about, well, how does technology impact society and what we do? And I'm a little biased in that. I came from an information school. That's where I got my master's and I got my PhD, where we wrestled with those sorts of questions. So we, we'd teach you how to write an algorithm and then be like, well, what's the impact of that on society? Right, so like that pairing of those two things. So it's like here at Georgetown, is there are programs where you can go and study those sorts of topics and engage in those rigorous debates. And the goal is to not come to the answer, but at least try and figure out like, how are we going to move into this future? How are we gonna to integrate tools and technologies, AI in particular, things like that, into the everyday work of what we do, right? And being inclusive of people with different backgrounds, different skills, things like that, to figure out how are we going to positively use that. So it's, it's one where it's like, yeah, there's not an exact course list to take or a programming list or things like that. But that's what I look for in bringing folks on. And we hired, like I said, is a huge number of those folks. And that was one of the key things that we were really looking for. And I don't think that's unique to NGA. 
you know, is being, I'm based out in San Francisco. A lot of friends who work at Airbnb, Uber, Facebook, all those sorts of companies, they're interested in the same sort of thing. It's not a millennial thing. You don't have to be a millennial to be interested in those sorts of things. There's anybody of any age or background, that is your style and attitude and approach towards life, that is of interest in this space right now, regardless of if you're NGA or national security or other companies and organizations. Very good, John. John, so you- Can I just you, add one thing to that? No, that's, a, that's yes, please. That, to, I was I'll just punch add you. on and say one of the best, um, one of the best data scientists at the National Counterterrorism Center uh, is one of the best because he started off as an analyst and he had what we refer to as digital acumen and self-taught Python uh, and quickly became uh, interested in how can I make things work to improve the outcome for all the analysts uh, in the center. And um, it's that analyst, you know, starting as an analyst and knowing what's important um, and bringing that to be able to, you know, put it in a data science context is what's made him really successful. And then we're, we're saying, hey, how do, we, how do we help seed more people uh, you know, with these digital acumen skills? So there's a lot, you know, when you come into the intelligence community, lots of opportunities to learn and continue to grow uh, in lots of different paths, including the, the sort of the digital science uh, or digital uh, or um, data science area. Very good, thank you. Um, we're Going to get to the Q and A in a few minutes, but a quick question for Valerie: um, the so the, the, the one of the conflicts within AI is that machines that they can only go so far. At some point, machines will tell you what analysts want to know why, and I'm curious if the technology has that ability to bridge that divide or. Is there a kind of a hard stop for what this can do? Um, and, and what's going to be the true breakthrough moment for AI uh, in this context? So you're talking about trust, basically. And uh, it's important that we understand the limitations of where uh, AI is today. And oftentimes, um, machine learning is, is sort of synonymous with what we can do today in terms of AI. But um, DARPA really looks at uh, the developments of AI as coming in waves, with the first wave being sort of rules-based. You understand the rules, you, then you, you program in, and then the current phase being this machine learning-enabled um, AI. And uh, as we've already heard, there are uh, numerous examples of where the current state of the technology can be very easily fooled. And unfortunately, we don't really quite understand the mechanisms. Um, we have some hints, so there's a, I'll give you another example. Uh, I believe this came out of an algorithm uh, from a student at UC Irvine, I think, uh, where he had developed an um, algorithm that would distinguish between wolves and huskies and demonstrated that this algorithm worked really, really well until it didn't. And uh, what they realized was that uh, the the algorithm in the training was actually looking at the fact that the wolves, if it was a wolf, there was always snow on the ground, and in the huskies, there was always grass on the ground. And so what it was really discriminating against was snow versus grass. And that's what we need to be able to understand, is what are the important features as we train these systems? Uh, because then, if we understand what the important features are in the training data sets, we could begin to ask the systems to tell us why, why did you why did you characterize this as a cat? And if it came back and said, well, it has a tail, it has pointy ears, it has whiskers. If it tells us why uh, it comes to a certain classification or an answer, then we can begin to understand um, what the limits are and, and where it's applicable. We think that the getting to that ability, and, and by the way, if we get to that ability, we can really start thinking about uh, AI machines as being um, moving from tools to actually partners, right? Collaborative partners is what's uh, what, what, what's sort of the next thing in AI. And there's a there's an aspect of um, understanding context and really beginning to um, uh, apply. Um, knowledge. So, so for a human uh, can discriminate a dog from a wolf um, by looking at context. If there's a human in the in the picture and it's throwing a ball, then it's probably a dog, not a not a wolf. We know that uh, because we've learned over time. Um, we need to get to we need to, to push AI into this next wave of causal reasoning and being able to understand context. Uh, and, um, and apply uh, prior knowledge to, to begin to um, work in a, in a way that uh, builds trust, 
uh, in, in the, you know, with the users and, and, and the human collaborators uh, because it's able to explain and justify and even under, you know, even even provide us the insight that, uh, in this case, I, you know, the machine does not know the answer and uh, can explain what additional information it might need in order to provide a, uh, a confident, uh, trustworthy, believable answer. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I believe we're going to move on to a Q and A element here. Are these all from students, or are they from? From everyone? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, how can industry better support the, uh, the I see in automation and analytics? How can industry support the integration of automation and analytics? Anybody want to take that? Sure, I'm from industry, so I'll take it. <laughs> um, I think it's by working in partnership together. So. Um, we do a lot of projects for the government, and I think where I see um, us have the most success is when it's a partnership between industry and government working together. Uh, we bring a certain set of technical skills and, um, and, um, and knowledge, and there's domain knowledge and skills that come from the government as well. And when you combine those together, it can be very powerful. Now, whether that's under a paid project or under a research project together, I think either way it can be successful. But I think that's the way that I think we can um, work to improve those things. I think one I would build on that is um, coming from, I worked in industry before, and then in academics, and then joined NGA. Uh, one that I would look at is for any companies who are doing work with, um, with the federal government, with national security and things like that, is being much more, I would say, and I'll be careful on my language, um, flexible, looser, relaxed with regard to like intellectual property, and I don't mean that in a legal sense, uh, but just in that knowledge of what we're creating together, right? In the sense of like, okay, I'm interested in what's going on in the AI world out in industry, right? And you wanna come bring that, you think that could apply in my agency for my analysts, right? Let's say that. Um, I really wanna understand how that black box that you're building, how that works. Um, and that's, that's for me as an organization, but then that's also for the trust of my analysts, that's for the trust of the public, right? So changing from perhaps an older model where it is one of like, we are an industry, we will provide this and not tell you how things work. I don't see how that's good. I, I don't think that will be successful going forward. I think it's being much more open and transparent, and we can go into what that means, uh, but being much more open with regard to what you're building, how you're building it, the limitations and the affordances of that, being much more clear with federal government, but particularly national security organizations. Okay, very good. Uh, excellent question here. From a cybersecurity standpoint, does the AI black box present a significant target for foreign intelligence, or could foreign intelligence load um, malicious uh, models into training models into our systems? Um, John, is that something you'd want to? <laughs> well, I'll just—it's uh, not really a, a CT thing, but um, uh, I would say yes, uh, definitely. Um, uh, if, you know, I'm thinking on the offense, that would be something we would want to do probably to, with our adversaries. Uh, uh, and so we always have to defend as well um, when we're thinking about, you know, if we have technologies um, that uh, we want to protect uh, and they're doing a, you know, a critical national security mission for us, uh, we certainly uh, want to protect them from our adversaries and, uh, and the cyber threats uh, are relentless against the United States in all sectors, so uh, it's a concern. Okay, very good. Um, you guys write really good questions. When artificial intelligence learns a wrong behavior, as we've discussed a few minutes ago, what is entailed in correcting this behavior? Can AI, um, can you let AI learn but program limited specific behaviors to correct that? Anybody? Is that I would say the answer is yes, and in fact, again, as we move into sort of the next generation of AI, uh, we believe that it's actually going to be a combination of the sort of the first two waves as, as part of the solution. The, the knowledge that we know, the rules-based uh, approach co combined with the, the, the training, and uh, one, of the, um, one of the challenges is being able to have uh, the capability to in increase the applicability of a particular system 
by improving its training without having to always go back and start from scratch in terms of the training set. So have it actually be able to assimilate knowledge uh, is, a, is a key goal of, of uh, some of the efforts that we're looking at, at at DARPA because it's actually key to getting to that next step. Um, interesting question. Versus private sector companies, um, are some uh, some of the best, their best some of the best uh, sources of innovation uh, in AI in the world? How can the U.S. government better partner with the organizations like Google, who, as we've seen recently, as this question cites, are reluctant to work on government missions, such as with Project Maven? So you have. Complete, and Andy, this is, you're part of both worlds now. Um, you have a completely different uh, perspective and mindset out in the West Coast than you do here in the DOD halls. Uh, how are we gonna smooth that out? So, yeah, so can you phrase the, I wanna be real careful on how I answer. So could you rephrase it one more time? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> or just like, how do we better engage with regard, you know, so one is, you know, um, DOD, let's just call it that, federal government and DOD, national security. How do we better engage with industry? How do we better engage with industry, but also prevent situations like Project Maven, where Google backed out of it because Google's um, very, I don't even know what the word would be, not liberal, but open-minded and, and not really, well, okay. you know. Yeah, let's, not, let's not charge it politically. It's, yeah. it's one where I would, I would say is, is, I'll go back to my, my earlier comment about working with industry, right? What it's gonna be going forward. Yeah. It's just being open and transparent as much as you can, with you know, being in national security with DOD, uh, with regard to what you're doing and why. Right? So how will this be applied? Don't hide behind, um, and I'm not, I'm not alleging that anyone did this, so I'm not speaking on behalf of like, what happened with Google or anything, not at all. Uh, but it's definitely one of like, don't hide behind, well, we're national security, cloak and dagger, like that kind of stuff, just like, no. Like, just don't, just don't do that. It's just one is like, what are we trying to do? We ingest lots of images, we wanna try and figure out how to analyze that. Here's how it's being used, here's how it's not being used. Right? and engaging in open dialogue conversation, not just with, say, the partner from that outside industry, or the partner, even the person who's in that room negotiating with you, but with that broader workforce writ large. Right? So it's engaging with that, and you know, for an organization being it's like, hey, you know what, we're thinking about working with the federal government, with the DOD in this sort of way, here's why, here's the risk of that, what are your thoughts on that? Right? And doing that early on in the conversation. Because um, I think that will help just better align what the goals are and not run into situations where all of a sudden people change their mind, is being open about the goals and mission of what we're trying to do so they can make a more informed decision at the time. I just wanted to remind, um, remind us in this conversation that there's reasons for the skepticism between those, that relationship. Um, and I think Annie makes a really good point that you want to be transparent about it. But we have a lot of different rules for private entities than we do for public entities. And when we blur the lines, that can be really messy. And I think we have also really demanded that our computer scientists, our technologists, our data scientists have an ethical education and ethical stance. Um, and so I'm actually not I'm not really interested in improving the way that that happened. That seemed like a, not a terrible um, way for that to end, where computer scientists, it felt wrong to them, it felt ethically uh, and morally uh, sketchy, and they took it to their the leadership. The leadership respected their, um, and, and the public was all a part of this conversation, which rarely ever happens. Like, we were actually brought in and, and were able to, to um, give a little bit of a two cents. Um, and so I, I, don't, I think that there is some room for more public participation in all of this, and that helps. Very good, thank you. Can I just add, I read an article uh, over the summer in The Atlantic by Henry Kissinger. Some of you may have seen it. And it's about artificial intelligence. And he basically um, makes a point that this is a technology that has the potential to change the course of history. And he puts it up there with the invention of the printing press and calls for a presidential panel to take a holistic look at the issue. And I think, it, you know, if you pull the thread on the Google piece, I think it's, there's a natural reluctance for people that, you know, they look at something that has potential power, and how do you actually appropriately deal with all the issues, the ethical issues and others that, that come from that? So uh, maybe that's something you want to check out, that article. Um, another question uh, from an analyst. With advances in artificial intelligence and the many applications and databases being used to ingest volumes of data, how are your organizations uh, getting the software into the hands of the customers? As an analyst, we struggle to gain access or learn these new technologies to help 
to better sift through the data? How are you sharing this knowledge? So how is this getting to the frontline um, analysts who will be using it? Is it still very much an R&D thing, or is it filtering down to them? And how do you, how do you, you know, hurry this along? <laughs> yeah, so it's one of, like in my role at NGA is um, founded and led a team called what we call the Data Core. Um, and what that was was the team of, I mentioned the 80 professionals that we hired the data folks to go do this. And it was one where what we would do is, is those team would go out there and solve data problems, you know, the way that we described it, right, in the sense of finding analysts and folks who are out there who are like, man, I'm really trying to do X and I just don't know how, I don't know how to code it. And what we would do is we would just sit down with them. The team would sit with them and co-design and co-develop. Right? It's like, okay, here's how you clean up your data, here's how you structure it, and build the tools with them. Not for them, right? Not as, you know, just kind of consult and bomb it in and run away, but instead of literally paired program, if you've done that before, is sit down and build things with them. So, and that was very much a grassroots effort where we would solve this analyst desk and learn, you know, this analyst challenge or problem, and then being like, okay, how can we share what you've learned with somebody else? You go teach, you know, the next person over, the next cube over, and doing like almost a social network, like contagion theory model of how are we going to spread this? is just teaching people the, the little basic things to be able to do this themselves, and then building a relationship with those folks to take, well, you've written a basic script, Let's now get you on the path of how you can apply your own computer vision algorithms, things like that. That's what we've found has been effective. And that's been about an eight or nine month effort doing that. Well, I would add that I think um, you're seeing more trends moving to web applications and things as well. So it's easier for people to access technology and information. So instead of um, in the past, maybe you had to request a piece of software and get somebody to install it and make sure you had the right environment and is there a server somewhere where you can load everything on. Right now, all of the back-end infrastructure, especially at places like the organizations these guys re represent, it's there and there's web applications available where, um, especially places like NGA, they're servicing out to the community to make people self-sufficient. And so I think that makes things like what Andy was talking about, they're doing with their team, even more accessible to a wide range of people, not just here in DC, but all the way out to the edges, right, all over the world that are doing important missions. Very good, thank you. Um, I like this question because it cuts straight to the heart of the matter and it's a yes or no. <laughs> All the skill sets mentioned are skill sets being sought in private and public industry. Is the government offering compensation packages to keep up with the private sector? <laughs> That's not my question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, all right, so. Applied experience doing this, right? So we hired a lot of people from industry, you know, in doing that. Um, we had a, a special opportunity where we were able to offer recruiting bonuses to folks, yeah. right, to be able to get to, to come do this. Um, so that was kind of, a, that was privileged. I recognize that, of being able to offer that to people to come and join us. Um, the one way I kind of look at it, like in this space, is one of, um, there's the compensation part, which is the hard numbers, and me hiring you, I want you to have a good life that you can save up to do all the things that you want to do. Um, come join us for a while. Come join us for an adventure, right? And, and do this, be part of this. Apply these technologies, these things you're interested in, in like super high stakes problems, right? It's like I'll throw rocks at my friends at Airbnb and industry and things like that, where it's like, was well, it really high stakes like what you're doing like with AI or machine learning? Like it's cool, but like, is it like, this is super high stakes. Like the opportunities you could have if you come join us are stuff that are like wild. Like I wish I could describe them to you, but you can imagine them. Um, so like I, I kind of turn it and being like, well, there's the number part, but I go like, well, how good are you? Come prove it, you know, come do some interesting, cool stuff. Join us for a while and then go out into industry. The, the runway for compensation here is really long, you know, and, and regardless of your age or anything, come join us for a while. Do some really super high stakes work and then go off into fill in the blank where you want to go next. You know, come and join us for a period of time. And Valerie, you, you work with um, private sector and you see how the, the personnel on the uh, public sector are responding to that. What is your reaction to that question? Is, is the, the lure of the uh, talent present? So I've been at several meetings jointly with uh, industry and government and there's a real concern that in certain technologies, AI being one of them, that uh, we, we have a problem that uh, the um, person power going forward is not gonna, not gonna meet the demand and that uh, students are actually being pulled out earlier and earlier in their careers and 
uh, we need we do need some to act, some people to aspire to be the teachers of the next generation as well. So uh, I'm glad to hear that there are these programs to incentivize. Um, we, uh, we, we try to do the same thing within DOD. Come work on um, some really interesting DOD problems and then, you know, take that and go out, you know, and do the next thing, so. Very good. And with that, we are at the end of our window for talk. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you guys got a good, good information from this panel.